relationship between tenants and landlords and how there's a lot of antagonism today. Like when tenants decide they hate landlords, when landlords decide they hate tenants, that's exactly what we get is all the worst case scenarios from it. People want to badmouth me on all, all these things and but when it comes down to it, let's talk about solutions. People lose money yeah. in real estate. It's not, it's not a win always, a win-win. That I'm going to yeah. win, I'm gonna get the most, I'm, gonna, I'm going to screw that tenant. No, the thing is that this is a long-term relationship and the tenants shouldn't be, you know, tenant and landlord shouldn't be butting heads, pitted against one another. What is up YouTube? In today's video, we're gonna be talking about the elephant in the room. And that elephant for real estate investors is really just the standoffish nature right now that's going on in society in general, in North America at least, between landlords and tenants. And this is really of concern to me because as landlords, we need to understand that our tenants are truly our customers. So us you know, being standoffish or aggressive with them does us no good. But at the same time, it's important that our tenants understand we're trying to provide a valuable and critical you know service and good that is housing so this is something that you know we're not going to solve with one YouTube video but I thought it would be great to share Casey Wong's perspective and my perspective in regards to how things have got so offside between tenants and landlords and maybe about how we can start bringing things together I really appreciate Casey taking the time to have this discussion especially during going through this controversy over the three cents you guys probably already saw that video and and that video really sparked this second video as well. So let's just dive into it with Casey Wong. What is up YouTube, Matt McKeever here with Casey Wong and in today's video we're going to talk about a little bit the relationship between tenants and landlords and how there's a lot of antagonism today. And so the first thing is, you know, what kind of prompted this was a recent series of like kind of news articles about yep. Casey in this building and to me the unfortunate part about this entire thing is that immediately people want to get their pitchforks out and they want to like, you know, stand on that holier than thou ground and like look down and judge people. And and I think there's a few things that we can unparse here, but the first one is understanding that if we approach landlord and tenant relationships as if they're always going to be antagonistic, yeah. like that's what we get, you know? Like when tenants decide they hate landlords, when landlords decide they hate tenants, that's exactly what we get is all the worst case scenarios from it, yeah. where it's really important that we understand that landlords, just like any other business owner, are really just trying to provide a service. That's right. And that service happens to be housing, but again, like the guy at the grocery store, or the convenience store, their service is just providing food, you know, or their service is providing gas or fuel, anything like that. So do you mind maybe just diving a bit into Casey, why do you think people want to immediately jump to those conclusions? You know, like when they see an N4 go out and they naturally want to paint it as you're trying to evict someone right away, when realistically the eviction process is very long here, so like it's not like someone was going to lose their house in four days if they didn't pay three cents. At the same time, why, why do you think people want to like band together and fight so hard against things that are just very clearly set out? This is my take. I'm not sure if it's right um, or if it's true in people's mind is that they think that landlords have a lot of money. Okay. Mm -hmm. I start off with uh, seriously meager beginnings. I didn't have a lot of money. Um, so they want to get the pitchfork out. They think that they have a lot of money. Um, I'm going to get them because they're slumlords. Like this is, this is the unit. Right, I'm not here to put people in slums and, and then charge outrage, outrageous rent. I'm not like that. We are not like that mm -hmm. as as a company. Um, but that's probably the take: is that give them the worst, the tenants uh, charge the most, right? Um, but it's it's not okay. We are in it. We we have to run a business. I still have to put bread on the table for my kids. Okay, mm -hmm. I, I have a family of four kids. My wife and myself. We started this business. Um, I worked. I grew up in Scarborough. I told you guys this before. Um, so I didn't come with <clears throat> a silver spoon in my mouth. And I work hard for my money. I lost money doing this. Um, but whatever business, it's from a gas station who a gas station attendant owner running after somebody who uh, gas gas and dash to a person that who has a store that needs puts groceries, let's say a broccoli or somebody, and somebody steals that, right? That that money, that broccoli, that gas, that chocolate bar, or this place that I put mm -hmm. here is money out of my pocket. 
I had to, we had to pay for this. It's an investment. Some of the returns is not great at the beginning, and some people lose money in real estate. Trust me, people lose money yeah. in real estate. It's not, it's not a win. Always a win-win. That I'm going to yeah. win. I'm gonna get the most. I'm gonna, I'm going to screw that tenant. No, the thing is that this is a long-term relationship, and the tenants shouldn't be, you know, tenant and landlord shouldn't be butting heads pitted against one another. We have to work together. The government, I understand we talked about this uh, like basically before this, uh, these talks is that rent control doesn't work, okay? Yeah. It's below that equilibrium between the supply and demand curve. There, once, you, once, you, once you put it below that equilibrium, you can have a shortfall of supply. You can have a over demand because people are not gonna be building because you're not making money. If I don't make money here, then I open a McDonald's franchise. It's easier to sell Happy yeah. Meals, I said. But the thing is that we have to work together. If this is making money, then this is a good business, a viable business. It helps community, but the tenant and landlord have to work together. Don't, don't put us together that we're going to fight and butt heads together. But there's always a solution. We always, I'm always driven by let's work together, let's find the solution. Mm. and. Yes, you can point the finger and say you're a bad, you know, bad landlord or bad Casey or whatever, right? But it comes down to it. Let's talk about solutions, things that we can work on, alternative, um, and ways that we can solve this problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. So don't. Yes, like people want to badmouth me on all, all these things, and but when it comes down to it, let's talk about solutions because that's the only way we're going to get ahead and through all this quote unquote, sometimes a mess. Yeah, and I think it's also important for people to really take a step back from whatever, you know, individual piece of data is used in like a news article or story and take like the 40,000 foot view. Yes. So like, for example, even just on this property here in St. Catharines, there's more to the story than just this building. So yes. because you bought this building, you also got land behind it where you plan to build like an additional how many units? We can, hopefully we can build 72 or 73 units affordable. So it's a portion of it's gonna be affordable housing. So we want to help. It's either going to be women's, you know, women and family, women and kids, or the elderly. So we we already have this strategy to help people. So it's it's going to be a win-win for St. Catharines for any like we're actually doing this in Vaughan as, as well. Um, so we we have a parcel of land that we're going to be doing. But I'd rather be doing it to th there's there's a need here in St. Catharines mm -hmm. for affordable housing for the elderly, and it's going to be substantially like almost the same prices as what they're paying now. So, but in a nicer, it's a nicer unit, well built, and wheelchair accessible. So it comes down to is that we work with the government to see if it's if it's doable, viable. But if you're going if you're going to tell me that hey, you're not going to make any money for the next 20 years, then the money's not going to go there. So business owners won't go there, right? So you have to make it make it worthwhile for business owners uh, as landlords to invest back into our community. And that's why there's a big shortfall. Remember I said yeah. 1960s and 70s, we had a, a lot of purpose built. 1980s, uh, there was a drop, there was a housing boom, but they actually put the initiatives out of, uh, the funding was out of the affordable housing. So now we have a huge, surp like we have a huge demand, mm -hmm. a shortfall in housing. And this is a way to get it back in, get the supply back up by helping uh, building owners, landlords, investors to come back into this community and start investing. So we see this as a win-win, uh, both for us, okay, as property owners, because now we can build and it's sustainable over the long term. <laughs> Getting the supply up actually brings down the value, okay? Yeah. Oh, sorry, the rent, mm -hmm. right? Once you have more supply, if you have 20 units available and only 10 people, it's a natural progression for the prices to drop, okay? If you have 20 people, okay, and only 10 units, it's a natural progression for prices to increase. Mm -hmm. So we have to get that, that laissez fair. It's like the government has to get their hands out, okay? Yeah. Let the market dictate supply and demand. We'll come to that equilibrium and we'll have that natural, uh, um, uh, uh, basically supply of uh, units come back on the market and then it can get back to that equilibrium. Yeah, because one of the big problems with rent control in my opinion is people always want to view it in a vacuum, but it's actually occurring in a very dynamic system, you know, the broad economy. And so what happens when we peg rent at a certain price, all of a sudden landlords are going to start changing their behavior based upon that sort of input. Yeah. So all of a sudden, if you tell me that I can only rent an apartment for $1,000 a month, the only landlords that are gonna to want to continue to operate in that ecosystem are gonna spend 
less and less money on maintenance. Yeah. They're not going to want to repair the property. The conditions are going to naturally deteriorate. But also what happens is a lot of uh, alternatives are found for that use of property. So then landlords move to Airbnb or they switch and start using properties as principal residents and sell off those small multifamilies and people start house hacking or converting them back to single family homes rather than using them as multifamilies. And again, it's really easy to just naturally think, well, if the government pegged rent at this price, everything would be fixed forever. But that's not the way it actually works. And consistently, like, I've, in fact, if you guys want, we'll link in the video description down below to like a half hour video I did on rent control where I really just like busted all the myths around it. All the economists agree that rent control doesn't work and yet still governments want to implement it because it's a really easy thing for people's feelings to get involved. And often when people get their feelings involved, the emotions and logic goes to the wayside. And so what it ends up doing, in my opinion, is really just buying votes for politicians. That's all the rent control is accomplishing. It's not helping out anyone else outside of the politicians, in my opinion. That great speech. This guy should be a politician, right? <laughs> they actually asked me, because I, I was actually, uh, uh, it, a couple years ago, a politician asked me, do I want to run for, run for office? I'm like, no, no, dude. <laughs> so you should do that. <laughs> this is the guy, this is the guy, vote for him. That's good. But yeah, so I, I think that that's just really important that we all understand this this basic concept because again, it applies to anything, right? Like, it, it's really easy for us to get emotionally attached to shelter because there's something special about shelter. But at the end of the day, no one should have a right necessarily to just like choose where they get to live. Because again, what ends up happening is the, the systems just don't work in a vacuum. So it just like, it's a recipe for disaster. Go watch that half hour video and really dive deep into the subject matter. Um, but again, I think it's unfortunate because naturally the the drama around landlord versus tenant really attracts the media attention. Yeah. So the media wants to jump in and dogpile on these sort of subject matters because again, it really gets people's emotions up. That's right. But at the same time, like when there's a development for say building a new 72 unit affordable housing, the angle the media will focus on is not in my backyard. I don't want you building those buildings in my backyard you know this is a quiet neighborhood things of that nature and we really have this problem where the government's interfering on both ends of the spectrum when it comes to housing and it's really creating that shortage that we're experiencing here in Ontario Canada right now so when people won't let you build high rises or mid rises in their backyard but also want you to keep rents at a certain price what ends up happening is supply gets squeezed on both ends of the spectrum it's true very true um, so yeah, anything else you kind of want to add about just kind of the antagonism that we're seeing right now between landlords and tenants or any thoughts on maybe how landlords can try and, you know, sm I guess like, sm yeah. Really, it's just dialogue, discussion, communication. I, communication. I think I have to do that more for this building in particular, is just to be out there and to talk to people and know where I'm coming from. Because I did put out actually quite a bit of money into the units as well as the, the common areas. Um, and some of the, the comments were, uh, it's, this is all cosmetic, or what you're doing is that it's, it's useless. Uh, but I do have to explain to them the balcony rails, uh, the stairwell rails, the lights, um, things like that. It's, it's actually um, uh, by the code, mm -hmm. all right? And it's not just cosmetic, right? It's really for their safety. So a lot of these things, um, landlord should talk more. I should be more like in their, um, in, in their homes, like just walk around in, their, in, the, in the community, talk to them and see what, what they're doing, right? Because I think a lot of these people want that and they wanna, get the, they wanna give their feedback and I have to tell them what's happening. And for the gardening, like the community garden at the back, uh, it's just a liability issue. And I did explain it to them, but I have to explain what could go wrong, which I did, mm -hmm. but it, it, they have to try to you know, see my, at my point of view. Once something bad happens, the, point, the, the finger points at, back at me because yeah. I, didn't do, I didn't do it. I didn't follow up. I didn't see the potential bad outcome. So us as landlords, we have to communicate more. Tenants likewise, in a nice, you know, in a nice form, in a nice way that we have to get our viewpoints out and then we have to work together.
Yeah, and one final point I guess I'll add to this video is it's really important for people on the tenant side of the argument to understand that like when a landlord comes in and buys a building like Casey did on this property, there are risks involved. There's no guarantees that you're gonna make money. There's no guarantees that once you open up that wall, you won't find a whole host of other problems or that the roof won't start leaking the day after you close on it. So it's really important we understand that, you know, real estate investing, while I think it's a great vehicle for Canadians to build their personal wealth. At the same time, it's no get rich quick scheme. It's no like easy one, two, three step process and all of a sudden you're just a millionaire overnight. There's a lot of hard work, a lot of risk and a lot of stress that goes into putting a deal like this together and then maintaining a property. Exactly, well said. Thanks again to Casey for taking the time to shoot this video. If you guys want more Casey Wong, what I need you to do is jump in that comment section and say more Casey. In addition, smash the like button and hit the subscribe button if you're new to my channel because we've got a lot more Casey coming for you guys. And if you haven't done so already, just like ding that notification bell so that you always get notified when we release more great YouTube content related to Casey. Speaking of Casey, if you guys want more Casey, check out this playlist right here. Or if you don't like that playlist of Casey, check out this playlist of Casey. Otherwise, until next time, remember, making money is a team sport. There's more than enough money in this world for us to all make it, but if you're not saving it, I mean, like, what's the point? This guy should be a politician, right? This is the guy. This is the guy. Vote for him.